What's up guys, Jordan here bringing you our review of Langrisa 1 and 2. This review is from our longtime friend and website collaborator Alex Grave, and he's going to tell you whether Langrisa 1 and 2 is a worthy alternative to Fire Emblem or not. Let's have a bit of background to the series first if you're unfamiliar. Langrisa is a role-playing game series that has had it rough outside of Japan, in that it's only had a few titles localized. The first game in the series, simply titled Langrisa, known in North America as Warsong, was a tactical role-playing game much in the vein of Fire Emblem. Released in 1991 in only Japan and America, and was initially released for the Mega Drive while later being ported to other consoles. In it, you control a group of heroes and commanders who, in every stage, must achieve a set of objectives, ranging from defending a certain person, defeating the enemy commander, and so on. All the while, you are aided by other non-playable commanders and their troops. The second game featured in this remastered collection, Langrisa 2, was originally released in 1994, but unlike its predecessor, the second game was never released outside of Japan, which would be an unfortunate trend for every subsequent sequel, until Langrisa Reincarnation Tensei on the 3DS in 2016, which is when the West would finally get back into the series. But let's slow down a bit and take things one step at a time. We finally got these two bad boys in the West, so let's take a look at those first and see what we've been missing, shall we? You are an arbiter of fate in a world ravaged by wars through generations of heroes who battle for peace, order, or chaos. Commander Ledin, Elwyn, and their friends try to obtain the sacred sword Langrissa and restore peace to the world, even deciding who your allegiances lie with in the game's branching stories. To be completely honest with you, I didn't get much of the plot at all. Not saying it's bad or uninteresting or, but I never did follow these war stories very well. I am, in regards to these, a simple man. Uh, I know I have to escort a fair maiden from some thieves, save the president's daughter from a sick cult, or rescue a princess from an evil dragon, but you know, as for the full picture in these strategy games, many times I had no idea what was going on. But, you know, just went with the flow. Neither Langrisa 1 or 2 has any intro cutscenes or wall of text explaining the situation to you. All you are given is a set of questions by the goddess about what is most important to you on the battlefield and what priorities you weigh higher in different situations, which will ultimately determine your main character's stats, uh, but you can choose to retake the quiz though if you're unhappy with the results. After that though, from the moment you select deploy from the main menu, you are thrown directly into the thick of it, with plot, orders and exposition being given to you as you go along. Langrisa is a strategic role-playing game. You embark on a mission via the aforementioned deploy option and are then given the option to hire a set of infantries to aid you on the battlefield, before the battle starts, of course. Each soldier costs a set amount of gold, but you start out with, you know, a neat sum of money, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And you are given the option to position them yourself or have the game do it for you. And when you're ready, you start the mission. As stated before, the battle will always start with a bit of story where someone spews out exposition or gives you an order or tells you what's going on, and then you'll be able to move your troops. Shortly after the battle starts, you'll be given your goal or winning conditions, which will usually entail escorting someone to safety, escaping yourself, or naturally just defeating your opponents. As the battle progresses, and depending on how it unfolds in or against your favor, more of the story will unfold, and foes and allies will continuously spout exposition, making the story feel integrated with the gameplay, which makes it feel more alive and organic. On the flip side, I feel that this is also kind of a game and watch experience. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. Langrissa is turn-based, think Fire Emblem, so every turn you are able to move every one of your troops either away from danger or approach the enemy to engage in battle, but even if there are allied forces on the battlefield, you can't actually control these, and half of every turn thus becomes a waiting game after you have made your own couple of moves where you just watch the AI move around and go to battle. There is no speed up function either aside from speeding up dialogue, but you are able to push the B button and skip an engaged battle animation altogether. In an RPG, most of your time is going to be spent fighting, and while watching hordes of chibi warriors rush the opponents never really gets too old, it is what you're going to be doing most of, both during your own and the enemy's turn. And with no real variety in music, it can quickly feel repetitive. So pushing B to skip battles became a regular activity of mine. When it's your turn, you're able to view your player's stats, as well as move yourself and the troops you brought at the start of battle around. In that sense, it's not exactly like Fire Emblem, as your troops are very much expendable, and the game doesn't really scold you for losing them, or you try to make you feel attached to them. 
unless you lose a fellow commander. You can move them around a set distance and then, at their new destination, decide whether you want to engage or just stand by. If you regret their new placement, you can push B to cancel your move. A move is only final when you choose either of those two options. Choose attack and you'll be able to hover the cursor over the enemy of choice where the energy meter above them will immediately show you what the outcome will be, whether you'll be victorious and should go through with it or whether you'll get your ass handed to you and perhaps should, you know, fall back and think of a better move. Enemies are divided into groups, each headed by a captain. This guy is of course tougher than his peers, but if you defeat him, his minions will fall with him and your commander will earn experience. Each slain enemy commander will also, when the overall battle is won, earn the character who did the deed X amount of CP. Points that at the skill tree in the main menu can be used to upgrade your commanders to new titles, making them stronger and granting them all new attributes, preparing them for even tougher challenges. It's also with these menus that you equip weapons and other items you've earned during your adventures. Langrisser 2 is largely the same game, only with a new story and characters, but it does do some things differently from the first game. Something that it was hugely praised for back in the day was that depending on your choices during battle, or whose side you decide to take, as mentioned in the story section, the story can have a lot of different outcomes, from you being heroic and slaying the dark armies with the aid of Langrisser, to you joining the aforementioned, or even going solo, not taking any sides but your own. If you want to experiment with different outcomes, you can always go back and replay previous chapter. You keep all of your money, CP, loot and so on, but be forewarned that your story progression will obviously be set back, so make sure you think about it before you commit. Also keep in mind that since the gameplay mechanics are the same as 30 years ago, uh, so are the menus and the saving system, which means no auto-saving. Meaning, remember to save manually before you quit the game. I made that mistake because, you know, I've been spoiled by modern gaming. Let's move on to the visuals. Maybe it's just me, but while the graphics are bright and colourful, the remastered environments and character sprites make me think of like a mobile game. In general, I think the remastered visuals of many classics like the Ace Attorney trilogy and the more recent Dragon Quest trilogy, they look lifeless and generic. Visually, they have lost their charm. That is why, thankfully, the game gives you the option from the main menu to go with either the remastered visuals or the classic. Sprite-wise, nothing much changes, not even in battle, which disappointed me a bit, but the battlefield itself changes from being hand-painted to pixel landscape. Maybe it's just because I'm old, but I like the archaic visuals much better. The character artwork changes drastically as well. I'm not one to criticize as I can't illustrate to save my life, but compared to the vibrant and lifelike 80s illustrations of the characters, I can't help but feel that the remastered redrawings look like cardboard cutouts. When I went into the option menu for the first time, unaware that you could even change the visuals, I was flabbergasted to see the difference. And though I wasn't even alive back then, I immediately missed a time where I feel anime was more visually distinct and had far more personality. I have the same feeling with modern anime where I feel much of the depth in the characters have been lost. And the same can be said for many modern 2D JRPGs as well. But that said, the visuals are of course purely cosmetic and you are even free to choose whatever combination you want to go with. Remastered maps with remastered characters, remastered maps with classic characters or vice versa. You can even choose to go all classic. Unfortunately, like with the recent Root Letter Last Answer where you could choose between hand-drawn visuals and live action, switching between these two is a bit of a hassle as you have to quit the game and go all the way back to the main menu of the collection itself, as opposed to remastered games like Another World or Flashback where changing in between them is done with the push of a button, so most players will probably just choose one style and stick with that one. The game features various characters who are all diverse and wonderfully illustrated, but I honestly couldn't tell you a first thing about their personalities. On a side note, some story segments outside of Battle will, if set to remaster, feature hand-drawn cutscenes as in like still images. You will miss out on those if you have the game set to classic, so keep that in mind. The music is very upbeat and energetic rock, which gets you pumped up for battle, but in this Germanic fantasy medieval setting, I did initially feel it was a bit out of place. And maybe it's me, but I didn't feel there was a whole lot of variety to the music either. A cool little detail though is, whenever you engage in battle, you hear the collective battle cries of dozens of soldiers rushing into danger, adding to the atmosphere of the fighting and filling you with adrenaline. Regarding the voiceovers, by the way, most dialogue is spoken, but only in Japanese. Yeah, I'm sad too. Worst remaster ever. 0 out of 10.
Okay, value. This collection sits at a whopping £49.99 in the UK, $49.99 in the US, which I will say is a bit much for an old re-release that has just gotten a new coat of paint. I mean, just recently we got yet another Mega Man collection from the guys over at Capcom in the form of the Mega Man Zero ZX collection, a package that comes packed with six full games complete with all manner of extras and bonus content for a very generous sum of £24.99 and $30. What we have here underneath the anime exterior of Langrisa 1 and 2 collection though is one of the forefathers of the tactical role playing genre, but a bare bones package otherwise, with two games, only one available to limited parts of the world originally, and the other released in the west now for the first time ever. Langrisa 1 and 2 does sell itself on its exclusive core content alone, but judging by the steep price and the utter lack of any sort of extra content, I can't recommend this unless you are a diehard fan of the genre and are eager to see how an obscure franchise got its start. The games themselves, they are fine, but what you see within the first 5 minutes is what you get, and really, that should be what matters the most. A certain indie developer once said that he did not understand the idea of why a game should cost less just because it's old, and while that could be a video debate in and of itself, I do see where they're coming from, but ultimately I do demand more for a price like this. With that said, Langrissa is a good, albeit repetitive time, with hours and hours of gameplay and story to experience, as should be expected out of an RPG. But unless you've got a raise this month and have spare cash lying around, I'd wait for a sale. Otherwise, if this review got you curious but you're still not sure if you want to dip in or not, you can always download the free demo from the eShop to try for yourself. Okay, Langrisser 1 and 2 wasn't exactly my cup of tea, unfortunately, but I still recognize them as solid enough games. And, and keep in mind that it's not so much the quality of the games that drags this score down, but more so of how little you get for that price and its repetitive nature. I therefore score them collectively a solid 7 out of 10. Right guys, thanks to Alex for writing this review. Be sure to head over to switchwatch.co.uk for more great content. Also, if this type of game takes your fancy, then perhaps check out some of the other games of the genre that we've reviewed. Super Robot Wars and SD Gundam G Generation are both fine choices for strategy RPG fans. We'll see you guys over there. Take care.